All right, everyone, I got our recording set up, and now it's 8.30, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick reminder, um, there we are going to start with Eco 201 class. Um, looks like there are about 50 people joining us, so if any of you are here for Eco 202, feel free to hang out for the next half hour uh, and relive Eco 201, or you can come back and join us at 9 when we will pivot over to the Eco 202 milestone one. So without further ado... Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started by sharing um, the milestone guidelines and rubric for Eco 201 Milestone 1. So this is, now, this is how you're going to be graded. That's why I want to start with that. Um, this is very much aligned with the final project guidelines. So one really important thing to know about this course and for Eco 202, which presumably um, a lot of you will take next term or at some point in the near future after you complete this course, is that the way the final project is designed um, is that it's meant to cover everything in the course, but as you work through the course, you're going to do chunks of that final project. Um, in this course, it's a final paper, um, and there are three milestones. So the paper is divided up into three pieces, and the first piece is what you're going to be working on this week and submitting. So uh, the nice thing about this design is that you get a chance to um, break up the work, which of course helps with time management and, and keeps, keeps us all from procrastinating, which uh, is so easy to do with schoolwork, especially when we have a lot else going on um, with work and family. So this kind of builds that, uh, that time management in for you. Uh, and it also gives you a chance to get some feedback midterm before you're going to be submitting that final paper. So in essence, you get graded on, on this work twice. So the first time you submit in your milestone, um, the expectations are a little bit lower. So to get a perfect score on your milestone is going to be a little bit easier to achieve than on the final project. The idea being that on your milestone, this is your first chance at it. You're just being introduced to a lot of these topics. Um, and you might need some feedback from your instructor to really get to the next level. So that's really the goal here, is for you to get something on paper, to put your best foot forward, and then have your instructor look at it, give you some advice and suggestions. You can take that, those advice and suggestions and redo each of these sections and put them all together for your final paper. So when you take a look at the final paper guidelines and rubrics, and compare it to this that we're looking at right now, the Eco 201 Milestone 1 Guidelines and Rubrics, you'll notice that for this section, which is just the introduction for this milestone, so it's a short one for you, um, the elements are the same. So where you see here Roman numeral 1 um, and A and B, these are the exact same things that you're going to see in the final project for this section. So these elements, we call them critical elements, but these elements are identical. Um, the rubric is slightly different. The rubric has three proficiency levels. So to get a perfect score here on the milestone, you only have to be proficient. But you'll notice, and, and hopefully some of you have already reviewed it, if you look at the final paper guidelines and rubrics, that there is an exemplary column. And this proficient column goes from being worth 100% to being worth 85%. So I just want all of you to keep that in mind as you do your work. Um, this is how we're going to be graded, but it's probably good to have that final pro project guidelines and rubrics out so you sort of have that endpoint in mind. Because a lot of you will be able to meet those, uh, those expectations for the final on your, on your milestone, and that's great. Um, so if you can aim for that, even in your milestone, that's, that's one way to take care of that. So it looks like Jennifer has a question. Um, we don't have audio for participants, Jennifer, so um, please feel free to type in your question in the chat. And I'll pause because it looks like there's been a lot of um, activity here. Um, OK. It looks like some people are having some trouble hearing me. Can most people hear me? Before I move on, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear. OK, all right. Um, OK, great. So yes, if anyone, if anyone is having trouble, 
usually, honestly, what works for a lot of students is just to pop out and pop back in. Um, and someone else suggested trying a different browser. So, um, so Jennifer, your question, I see it here in the chat. Do we need to actually write an outline, or should the intro just include the purpose of our papers? That's a, that's a really great question, Jennifer. Um, and I'm going to get to that um, when I show you the template, but I'll answer that question now briefly. Um, so in this sense, it's not an outline. It's outlines as in the in the verb sense. So in this, when we say outlines the purpose of the paper, it's just another way of saying describes the outline of the paper or discusses says what the outline of the paper is. So um, in this sense, in this case, the purpose of your paper is to, um, and you'll get a better sense of this when you look at the final project guidelines and rubrics because you'll see the whole paper laid out for you what you have to cover. But the purpose of the paper. Um, in a nutshell, is to analyze um, the firm of your choice, the company of your choice, their business and their industry using the microeconomic principles that you'll learn about in the course. So that's it kind of very briefly. Um, you'll want to expand on that a little bit in your purpose statement. But um, this kind of purpose statement at the beginning of a research paper is very typical with this kind of academic writing. Um, it'll be a, short, a shorter paragraph. Um, that, again, just tells the reader what this paper is going to be about um, and what kinds of conclusions um, it hopes to draw. In this case, your conclusions are going to be, um, and again, this is all outlined in the whole final project guidelines and rubric, your, your paper is going to come to some suggestions for the company going forward. So that's the conclusion that you're going to make, what you suggest the company ought to be doing um, in the future. So that's kind of how you'll structure your purpose statement. And um, you can always read the example paper that we have in the class um, to get a better sense of it. And really, any academic papers you see are going to have this kind of language. So feel free to, um, you know, when you're doing your research, if you find anything along those lines, that should give you a sense as well. All right. So Joyce has a question about um, safe check. So each milestone is submitted through safe check for plagiarism, but once the final paper is submitted, our work is no longer original. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, Joyce, that you mentioned that because um, we have a couple other instructors on the line, and I don't think that I've seen that as an issue on the final paper, maybe because it's the same author and they know that it was submitted through the same course. But I haven't seen that come up because pretty much everyone's would be nearly 100% match. Um, you know, some students do make quite a bit of edits, but we have some students who don't need to make a lot of edits at all, and I don't see those coming through as 100% on the final in terms of um, a match. So th there must be a way around that. But just to reassure everyone, if yours comes through, if your milestones are fine, you know, you don't have a high match score, um, and then your final paper is just you put all your milestones together and then it's coming through as a high match because it's matching to your milestones, your instructor is supposed to be looking into that report and seeing what it's matching to. And if they see that it matched to something that you submitted in this course earlier in the term that was all above board, then, then they would just sort of dismiss that, that reporting, that number, and, and not count it against you. What exactly is a high match? That's a really good question. Um, when I started with SNU, we, we always used 20 to 25 percent as a benchmark. Um, but some people, you know, some students have higher than that and some students have much lower than that. Um, and then that's just kind of a cue to us to investigate. So a lot of times if you're using um, a lot of graphs, or um, data tables that you're borrowing from a source, that could lead to a high match score. But if you're citing those sources properly, then that's, up, then that's usually fine. What we don't want to see is, even if you're citing things properly, we don't want to see you borrowing lots of language from your sources. We would much rather see you take your research and put it into your own words and paraphrase it. So you're still going to be citing your source, um, but we want your own words. Um, with a data table or graph, obviously, you know, you can't change those things. So those you'll have to borrow whole um, and still cite. So the easiest way to make sure you don't have a high match score is um, just to paraphrase what you find and put it in your own words. Yes, I'm, I'm glad that um, that cleared it up. 
Okay, so we don't need to go through this rubric anymore. I just really wanted to highlight the difference between um, how you're graded for the milestone and how you're graded for the final. So you can keep that in mind and really use both rubrics um, when you're constructing your milestones. So that's this is the case for all three milestones. All right, so if I missed any questions, um, feel free to pop them in the chat again. But just a reminder to the students online, we do have a handful of instructors online with us that are helping me in the chat. So if I miss a question, hopefully they, they'll grab it. So thank you to all of the instructors who are here helping me out. Yes, Joshua, that's a great way to put it. It is basically a thesis statement. Um, and the purpose statement in the introduction should be, yeah, about one paragraph. Um, <clears throat> and no, you don't have to start a new page after that paragraph. So you can, um, your, your intro paragraph, which will include your, your purpose statement, um, will be your purpose statement, will be that first paragraph on the first page after you do your title page and after your abstract page. Um, you don't have to have your abstract written yet, but eventually you'll have an abstract page just to keep that um, APA formatting in there. Um, so on your first page of actual content, you'll have the, the purpose statement paragraph. And then from there, you will go right into um, the second element here, which is the history um, and overview of your firm. So um, Melora, yes, once again. So again, the purpose of, your, of what you're doing in your paper um, is to use the principles of microeconomics that we cover in this course uh, to make suggest to analyze a company's business and the industry that they're in and make some suggestions for them going forward. That's it kind of very briefly. Um, so you'll obviously get into more specifics when you write your purpose statement. And your purpose statement at this point in time might be a little bit briefer than it will be when you edit it for the end because by then you'll know a lot more about your industry uh, that your firm is in and the firm itself. So you'll be able to flesh that out a little bit more. So again, like I said, the expectations for the milestone are a little bit lower than the expectations are for the final. So this is definitely one area where we do often see students needing to make some um, enhancements between the milestone and the final to incorporate all the extra knowledge that you're gonna learn as you go through uh, the course and have more experience with um, the concepts that you'll study, and also through your research. Melora, you summed it up pretty good. So, Lissanti, I hope that that um, Melora answered your your question. Um, we are recording this, so if you miss anything or or wish you had jotted it down, you can definitely be watching the recording tomorrow once we get it shared with the class. So let me share, I'm going to go ahead now and share the template, um, which basically just takes, <coughs> excuse me, those elements that we just saw in the rubric and explains how to meet the expectations for each of those elements and how to, how to do a good job with each one. So Nadine asks, um, the outline for milestone one is just saying that this paper is about the history um, and what the company is looking to achieve. Um, maybe not, not exactly. Remember that this is just a chunk of your paper. So you're just writing the first part of your paper, which includes the purpose statement for the entire paper, which is your microeconomic analysis of the company that, you're, that you choose and, their, and the industry that they're in, um, and your suggestions for the company going forward. At this point, obviously, you're not going to have suggestions yet for the company. You haven't figured that out yet. So your purpose statement is basically just going to say, we are going to analyze whatever firm you picked and whatever industry they're in um, using the microeconomic principles. And, and you can list which ones they are. They're all listed out in the final project guide um, in order to make some suggestions for the company going forward. Again, you're not going to have those suggestions yet, but you're just going to state in your purpose statement that that's the purpose of your paper, to make some suggestions for the company. So yeah, the final project rubric um, gives you the whole, all the stuff that you're going to analyze. Um, we haven't, obviously at this point in the term, we're only in week two, you haven't gone through all those concepts. Um, but just to give a quick overview, it's supply and demand, um, which I believe we're starting this week. 
Uh, and then from there, price elasticity of demand, which we get to, I believe, in week three. Um, costs of the firm, which is a little bit more relatable. We all know that firms have costs. Um, and then from there, the, the last section before your suggestions is the overall market. I don't think I missed any. So um, where you look at the whole industry and where your firm fits into the whole industry. And then at the very end of the paper, you're going to be making some uh, recommendations for the company that you picked. Um, so that's how your paper is structured. So all that stuff is listed for you in the final paper guidelines. So definitely read through that before you do your, your purpose statement because that's going to help you um, kind of just mention the microeconomic principles that you're going to be employing in your paper. So Josh asks, if uh, is the short title an abbreviated form of the main title? Um, so usually, yes, it's just if, you're, if your title is long, you'll abbreviate it. If your title is short, then you don't have to abbreviate it. A lot of students just use the name of the firm as the title of their paper. Um, some students come up with something a bit more clever. <laughs> um, but just the, for the running head, you just want it to be something short that can fit at the top really easily. Um, so Tanya asks, for the history portion, do we have to put the entire history of the company? Um, well, you're going to, so Tanya, we, we can get to that in the, in the guide here. Um, let, me, let me jump down to there since, since you've asked that question. And we've talked about the purpose statement a lot. Um, so you'll see there's a title page. There's an abstract page. You can, you're not going to fill this in just yet because we're only in Milestone 2, and you're probably not going to be prepared to write, write your abstract. But you can just leave a space for it. Um, that will help you not forget. Um, and then you'll see here that you go right into, um, this is going to be where your purpose statement will be. And then from here, you go into the history of the company and an overview. So the history of the company, um, you just want to make sure that you're talking about the most important pieces that explain how they started, especially in terms of what kind of products or services they offered, and how they evolved. Um, so, you know, in a case like, well, somebody said the Hershey example, which um, is the student sample that we share in the course, uh, you know, in, in that example, you know, when did they start? You know, how long has Hershey been in business? A really long time. Um, not all companies are like that. Like Netflix, you know, is one of the companies on our list. Um, that's a much younger firm. So when you have a company that's been around a long time, your history might be longer. So you just want to focus on the important things, um, how, how they've evolved, specifically in what kinds of products and services they've offered. So, you know, maybe Hershey just started out as just making chocolate bars. And then from there, they started making different kinds of candy bars. And then they, I believe they bought Wrigley gum, and now they started producing gum. And um, all, all the other major things in terms of their evolution and, and what they put out um, for customers is sort of what you're interested in. And then coming up to present time, what are they offering now? What kinds of stuff are they selling to their customers in present day? So um, that's what we want to sort of get a feel for in this section. So that's why it's a history and an overview of where they are now. Um, so Donna asks, um, should we leave the titles such as abstract history of company? Um, well, abstract will stay the same, um, Donna. Um, history of company, you might want to switch out company for the actual name of your company. So if it was Hershey, you know, history of Hershey company or whatever it is. Um, you can come up with things that are a little bit more clever, too. That, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. But I would definitely personalize it for your firm at the very least. So here... Um, on the second page, we're not doing this. This is for Milestone 2, but where it says supply and demand conditions on this page at the bottom, um, you might say, you know, supply and demand conditions for, and then the name of your company, just to, to personalize it. Um, all right, so there's a lot of questions. I want to make sure I'm not missing any. Um, does your instructor need to approve the company? Uh, yes, and Nadine answered you, Deborah, but just to reiterate, yeah. So if you're picking from the suggested companies list, 
Um, do let your instructor know that you've selected a company from that list, but th those are pre-approved. So that's why we have this list. So you know you've got a pre-approved list of companies that, that are good to go. If you're choosing from off of that list that's provided in the course, you do need to make sure that your instructor gives you the thumbs up because there are some company choices that are going to make it very difficult to, for you to do your work. And we don't want to set you up for failure just because you picked a company that, that doesn't meet the guidelines um, or that it might meet the guidelines, but it's still just going to be really difficult. So um, if you have an idea that's off of that list, before like tonight, <laughs> email your instructor if you haven't already and um, see what they say. Um, Jennifer Cashman, that list should be in um, in the final project resources area. Um, so I believe if you clicked on the left hand navigation, there's it should say project resources or final project resources, and you can click on that and it should bring you to um, to a list. So Stephanie, yes, you you do have to run your company choice by your instructor. Um, you have to let, sorry, Stephanie, you have to let your instructor know what your company choice is, regardless of where you get it, whether it's from the list or not from the list. If it's from the list, it's pre-approved. So you're just letting them know. If it's not from the list, you do need to make sure that they're okay with you doing that, that um, selection. Okay. So we'll see here in history of the company, um, and again, I've probably said a lot of this already, so um, we'll just stay up on this piece of the paper. Um, the company list is, is here as well, although that this one might be outdated, the one that's in your guide. Um, so do make sure you get the one that's provided in the list. One of our companies uh, is no longer a publicly traded company, so we can't share that with you guys anymore. Um, you won't have access to the data you need if it's not publicly traded. Um, so once you've got your company picked, um, you're going to give a, a brief history and then make sure that you also talk about what the company is doing now. Those are the two main points in this, in this element that you want to cover. Um, between the purpose statements and the history of the company, this section should be about two pages long in writing. So you're going to have your title page, you're going to have your abstract page, which will be blank, um, which, you know, or you can just say, I'll put the abstract here, you're just something, a placeholder. And then so from there, you'll have two pages, about two pages of content. Um, it might be a little bit longer if your company has a very long history, um, but it shouldn't be longer than three pages. So use that as your guide. <laughs> so as not to get too bogged down in, um, in the history stuff. You know, we don't need to know who every president of the company was or every new store that they opened or, you know, anything like that. You really want to make, keep it relevant to um, the, the products and services that the company is offering. Yep, yeah, so Ellen um, answered Lasanti's question. This, this template is available. Um, this is the, whole, the template for the whole final paper. Um, we do have it broken up by milestone in which case it would just be this, these first um, two pages here, first three pages, title page, abstract, um, and then this third page. Um, if we go, if we continue down, you'll see the rest of the, uh, of the papers included here. But one thing that is applicable to each milestone that we'll skip down to is the, um, the reference page. So as you all know, a lot of people have mentioned it in the chat already, we do use APA formatting for our citations and our references. Um, so your reference page will be here uh, at the very end on its own page. So it always starts on its own page. Um, entries are alphabetical. And if you need any guidance on this, our people have already mentioned, you can use Purdue OWL. And also our library um, has a lot of fantastic resources online for citation management. And there's some links to that in our classroom. So um, definitely, if you're new to APA, um, check that out. And then there's a lot of free online tools like um, Cite This For Me that you can also use. So I'm just making sure I haven't missed um, any questions. 
So Andrew asks, could you explain active voice, please? Um, are you referring to, was that somewhere up at the top, Andrew, in terms of writing style? I just want to make sure I, I answer your question properly. Um, uh, okay. Um, the, the passive voice, uh, I'm struggling. You can tell that I'm not an English instructor <laughs> with how to describe this. So <laughs> um, anybody who wants to help me explain this, um, it, it, you're going to come out and say the things that you're that you're going to do. So uh, in your in your purpose statement, you know, the paper will is going to analyze um, supply and command demand conditions for the firm instead of saying supply and demand will be analyzed. Um, I, I, that's that's basically what we're getting at. Um, I hope that that <laughs> that sort of makes sense. So you're going to be using active verbs, um, like you know, especially in the purpose statement, um, specifically in the purpose statement to say what the paper is going to do. Um, so that's that's really what that's getting at. And and this isn't specific to this paper. That's just general practice for writing a purpose statement in general. Um, in these kinds of research papers. So that's that's just some standard language for how to, like a best practice for writing an intro statement. <laughs> Ellen was an English major. Ellen Sloss is one of our instructors and I had no idea. Nope, I will be the first to admit that while I'm an instructor in Eco 201 and we have this, this paper as our assignment, Writing is not actually my favorite thing to do. So for students who are in the same boat, trust me, I, I empathize. <laughs> um, I think at the end, you're really proud of yourself and you feel good when you write a good paper. But I am in the camp of, wow, this is really hard. <laughs> so yes, Nadine, that was well done. Much better than my example. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, all right, so um, very good. I think we've covered the main points. We've definitely covered the two elements. There's only two elements that you're going to be graded on, and then you're always graded on um, articulation of response, which is just making sure that you don't have any grammatical errors, spelling errors, um, or citation errors. Um, so that's always included. But the content elements are just those two things. Your, the purpose of your paper, making sure that you're explaining that clearly to your audience, um, what the paper is going to do, using that active voice, and your overview and history of the company. Um, and again, making sure for that second element that you give the background of the company in terms of their products and services and what they do now in terms of their products and services. Um, so we can see that clear evolution of them as a company and, and how historically they've um, changed what they do to meet changing demand and changing supply conditions. All right. I think I might have seen someone raise their hand, but it's down now. So if you do have a question, pop it in the chat. We do just have a couple minutes left before we go over to our ECO 202 students. So um, any last minute questions you have, get them in. I'm so glad to hear that this was helpful. And again, this is going to be recorded. Um, it will be recorded as one big meeting. So, excuse me, for ECO 201 students, you'll start from the beginning. For ECO 2 students, you can fast forward to the halfway point to pick up at your spot. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. And ECO 202, um, thank you for joining, uh, for waiting for us while we finish up 201. Um, Ariana asks, where do we listen to this recording? Um, it's going to be posted on YouTube and then will be shared with all the instructors to post in the class tomorrow. So expect it sometime in the afternoon tomorrow. Um, e, so someone asks about the author affiliation on the first page. Um, that's just your school. So you can just, yeah, no, you can just write uh, SNHU or, or Southern New Hampshire University for the author affiliation. You're welcome. All right. All right. Eco 202. Uh, let's get your stuff up. <coughs> Excuse me.
<coughs> excuse me, I'm still getting over a cold. Uh, so if I still have to cough a little, it's just because I don't usually talk so much in a row. <laughs> Hi, Kiara. Um, Eco 202 students, just to let you know, we do have a handful of instructors um, in the chat with us to help me keep up with all your questions. So um, they're here. Just feel free to fire away your questions in the chat. Whatever I don't get to, they'll be answering. Um, we do have a lot of stuff to cover, so I want to get right into it. Um, what I'm going to share first with you guys is your rubric. Um, so this is going to tell you how you're going to be graded. So I, I always like students to start with that. Um, so you kind of get a sense of your expectations before you jump into the template. So here we go. We've got the milestone one guidelines and rubrics. So one thing I want you to note, and that if you haven't done this already, I really suggest you do once, once we finish up this, this webinar, is to look at this, this document side by side with the final project guidelines and rubrics document. What you're going to notice is that the critical elements are the same. So this, we are going to do section one. Um, and these elements that are described here are identical to the ones in the final project. So like I told the last group of students, for those of you who were on the line for that one, um, the way that these two courses, both ECO 201 and ECO 202, um, have been structured is that the final project is simply broken into smaller sections for you to do as milestones. So in essence, when you do the work on the milestone, you are doing work on your final project. Those of you who have already taken 201 are very familiar with this. So it's the same setup. Um, so you can expect the same thing. You're going to be submitting your milestone, getting feedback, and that feedback is going to help you improve your, your project um, so that you can meet the, ex the higher expectations of the final draft. Um, and like you might remember from Eco 201, if you've already taken that course, a lot of you are already, maybe this, you just, you did a really fantastic job in the milestone, and you already meet the expectations for the final, and that's great. Um, but we understand that on your first try, early on in the term, you might not be ready to meet those higher final project expectations. So this is um, a sort of first step towards that goal, and um, to give you a chance to kind of test the waters, put your best foot forward, um, get some feedback, and make improvements. So you'll notice that, and again, this is the same as it was in 201, um, and a lot of other classes here at SNU that use this approach in their course design, that in the milestone rubric and how you're actually going to be graded, there are only three proficiency levels, um, with proficient being the highest giving you a 100% score. So you can be proficient on each of the elements covered here um, and get a perfect score. That doesn't necessarily mean that for the final that you're still going to get a perfect score. You might still have some additions or improvements or tweaks to make in order to reach the final project um, perfect level expectations. Um, so keep that in mind as you work. You can just use this rubric. What I suggest, though, is to use this rubric and, again, have the final project rubric next to you so you see what that higher level expectation is for the final. Because you might be able to do it right here, right now. Um, there's no need to, to try and to, to not even try to reach that goal. Um, it's OK if you don't. And again, that's why it's been designed this way. But I always think it's, it's good for students to have that final product in mind. Um, It'll keep you more efficient. And that way, even if you don't reach that goal, you still always have it in the back of your mind from, from this point going forward. Um, and it will also make interpreting your feedback from your instructor easier if you know kind of what they're guiding you towards. So that's how this is set up. Um, there are, and we're going to go through them in the template um, because that's a little bit more user friendly. But there are five critical elements that you're going to be scored on plus the articulation of response piece, which just looks at your grammar, writing, um, organization, and your citations. So those five critical elements um, are, what compromise the, are what comprise this, this milestone. And these are mostly focused on data collection. So we're going to head over to that now. And I will show you the template that you can use to sort of answer the expectations of each of these five elements. All right, so let me pull that up. 
So now this um, is shared to you in a PowerPoint form so that it, it sort of mimics what your slides, how your slides will be structured. So we start off with um, this intro slide that goes over the 10 year period of the US economic history. Um, so you're picking a 10 year period between 1950 and today. And this is just a chance for you to sort of mention some of the, the highlights from that, that time period. This isn't graded per one of those elements, but what it's going to do is it's going to set you up for some of those later elements where you do have to connect these historical events to, um, to economic data. So then we get into the critical elements. Um, so the first one covers GDP. So this first bullet point here, um, gross domestic product and growth aligns with the first of two GDP critical elements. So this one, you're going to need to show a graph of real GDP growth rates. So the growth rate um, for each year of your decade and highlight significant changes in growth rates, such as dips or negative growth, which would be a recession, or booms, which is also called economic expansion. Um, in the template, which you all have access to in your course under final project resources, there's a link to um, FRED. So FRED um, is run by the St. Louis Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, which you'll learn later on in the term if um, you're not already familiar with it, is our country's central bank. Um, and they have a number of locations um, around the country. One of them is in St. Louis. Um, we've got one in Boston, um, one in New York City, one in San Francisco. Uh, there's uh, quite a few others. Um, but the one in St. Louis is the one that has this research database of all this economic data that they get from various places like the Census Bureau, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they compile it all in this really amazing user-friendly way. You can create graphs um, and you can take those graphs and plop them right into your presentation right here, or you can just get the numbers um, and calculate your own growth rate. But that's really going to be the site where you find almost all of the data that you need. So um, play around there. They've got, um, here's a video that kind of walks you through how to use the FRED site. Um, and then if, if you ever still are unsure of how to use all the data that's presented there, how to find what you need, you can also just kind of Google search or search on the FRED website their own educational materials. They have a lot of materials explaining how to use their site. Um, so a lot of that's out there. They use this for high school courses, for tons of college courses. Um, so they've, they've really tried to make it um, very user friendly and put a lot of materials out there to assist you guys. So uh, thank you, Ellen, for sharing the direct link in the chat. If people want to take a look at it now, the links on here uh, won't work. Um, this is just, but they, they, they will work when you open up your slide. Um, you do have to put it in, in presentation mode when you look at the slide um, to get the hyperlinks to work, just as a quick note. Um, if somebody wants to put that in the chat, <laughs> Ellen or, or Chiara or Bill, um, just as a reminder, again, to get these hyperlinks that you see here to activate in the PowerPoint, you have to put it in presentation mode. Um, so you have that stuff here. So that's that's the first that's the first element of um, the first critical element here that you're going to address. Now it's going to be about one to two slides. A lot of students like to do each element on its own slide. So you might have one slide where you just show that graph and you discuss um, what the graph is showing. Again, highlighting those changes that you see in any dips or any booms or you know, if it's just steady growth, you would just remark on what you see. So make sense of, of the graph that you're showing. Um, and that will show that you understand what it means. So that's really what your instructor is looking for, for your understanding of, you know, what does, what does negative GDP growth rate mean? You need to show that you understand that. Um, and then the next element that falls under the GDP section is to choose two or three of the most relevant events from this time period um, and apply specific models developed throughout the course to demonstrate how these influenced GDP. So now, this is one of those times where the milestone, your milestone writing might be 
not as advanced as what you produce for your final project. You're going to be looking at models throughout the term. You haven't looked at everything yet because we haven't covered the whole course yet. But there's one thing that you can use that you, you are prepared to do in this milestone, and that's the GDP formula. Um, there are some models that we're going to work on later in the term, in the next couple of weeks, um, that you won't be able to talk about here and you might want to add in uh, for your final project. But for now, you can definitely apply the GDP formula. So the GDP formula is, is just very straightforward. It's broken up into multiple components. Um, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So any change in either, in any of those things, is going to impact GDP. So if there was an event that impacted consumption, we would see that in GDP, all other things equal. If there was an event um, that impacted exports or imports, we would see that show up in the GDP numbers, everything else being equal. Okay, it looks like some people have, where do we get this template with the links? So, um, again, this, this template that I'm sharing here is available in the courses under Final Project Resources. So if you click there on the left hand, um, the left hand navigation in your, in your Blackboard course, it'll bring you to a whole list of, um, of resources for the final, um, these, these template guides being one of them. Okay. So, that's how we cover those two elements. And again, you can put them all in one slide as long as it's not too busy. Some people are really good at making everything nice and concise. Um, some people feel the need to separate them out. The other thing I want to mention before I go on to the next slide is that you are required in this, in this uh, final project, in all, in all parts of the project, the milestones and then on the final draft for week seven, um, to use the notes area. Now, we don't have this here um, in, the, in the template because we're not giving notes um, because this isn't an actual presentation. It's sort of just walking you through each of the, each of the elements. But in your, in your presentation, the idea is to make this as much like a real presentation you would give to your classmates um, or to your colleagues as possible. So when you're presenting a PowerPoint presentation to a group at work or at school, um, you don't want there to be too much text on the slide. So you're going to put maybe a graph and some key bullet points on a slide, and then you're going to show that slide to your audience and you're going to explain it. So those words that you would use to explain it speaking in front of an audience, you obviously don't get the opportunity to do that in, in our online course. Um, so those things that you would say where you're presenting it to an audience, you would put into the notes area of the final project. So that's your chance to explain the, in more detail what you've presented in your slide. So every slide that has content should have that, um, should have some notes. And um, our example our student example um, gives you some guidance. Our, the student example, I will admit, is very notes heavy. And I don't want you to think that your speaker notes have to be as long as that example. Um, but it, what I do want you to look there for is what kinds of things the student talks about um, or you know, is addressing in her notes. So that's more the guide I want you to take away. You don't need to have it be so long. Usually, depending on, um, on your slide, it'll be a paragraph or two that you write in the notes, in the speaker notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if, and if you're unfamiliar with how to even access the speaker notes, um, honestly, <laughs> the easiest way for you to, excuse me, for you to figure out how to get that stuff, how to get to the speaker notes area once you've got your PowerPoint slides open, is to just Google a YouTube video. I mean, I have some YouTube videos that I could share with you, one that I share with the class, but, um, and, you know, I can, we always remind the instructors to email it out, but you could just, as soon as we get off the discussion here, if you're unsure how to get that, you can find, in a minute, not even, <laughs> a minute, uh, a YouTube video that tells you how to do it. See? Ellen already made one. <laughs> um, so... Do, do remember to do that for every slide. Um, if you do take a look, a look at that rubric that I showed you a moment ago, um, the needs improvement proficiency level, 
is where you will be if you do not use speaker notes. Um, that is a 75% score for milestones, but that becomes a 55% score for the final draft. So if you submit a final draft that has no speaker notes, that would translate to a grade of 55%, which is obviously not a passing score. So that's why we're all really doubling down on, on the speaker notes thing. We don't want anybody to miss out on any points just because of that. All right, thank you so much, Ellen, for sharing that, that link. It's, that's why I need my, all these helping hands <laughs> in the chat. I can't, I can't get all that stuff while I'm presenting. All right, so let's move on to the next couple elements. Um, oops. Here's the, sorry, the page finder, okay. So the next two elements cover unemployment and inflation. So again, the focus of this milestone is on data collection. A lot of the data that you collect and present here, you're gonna be referring back to in the next two milestones. Um, so think of it as an investment. <laughs> um, so you're gonna get data for unemployment and inflation. Uh, and inflation. This is just like uh, in your, in the GDP section. It should be annual for every 10 years that, um, that your time period covers. Um, every once in a while, I'll see some students who just give like a few years of data, like the beginning, the middle, the end. And we really want to do see every year, and ideally in a graph form. That just makes it a lot easier, I think, to, um, to absorb and see the trends when you present it graphically. Uh, so, and, and that's just, it tends to be what, um, what economists in the field do when they have data like that. Um, they present it in a graph as opposed to a table. Um, so we've got some links here um, to help you get to the data that you need. Um, and then also you'll notice that there are hyperlinks here at the very top for unemployment and, and inflation. That's just going to link you to some of the videos in, our, in the MyLab course um, that review those concepts. And then um, once you've got your data up, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to explain how unemployment how inflation and unemployment are cal calculated for the data that you've presented. So you want to make sure that you understand which inflation index you're using. Um, and then also discuss how changes in unemployment and inflation are related to the changes in GDP growth that you already presented. So a lot of these um, second bullet points, the explain how inflation and unemployment are calculated and discuss how the changes are related to GDP. A lot of that detail is going to come in your speaker notes, where the graphs will be the main focus of your slides. Um, that's the first element here. The second element is this um, second major bullet point. Apply specific models developed throughout the course to demonstrate how the previously selected events influenced both unemployment and inflation during this time period. So. This is where you're going to see, again, those, those, same, those same events that you looked at earlier um, that you sort of previewed, you're going to see how unemployment and inflation fit into that. Um, what a lot of students do with these elements uh, is they do, for both critical elements, they do unemployment on one slide. So they show the graph, they explain how unemployment is calculated, um, and they discuss how it's related to GDP, and then they apply the specific models um, to discuss, you know, the, the historical events. And then they do that same thing for inflation. Some students like to break it up a little bit differently. They do the data stuff on one slide and explaining the data, and then on the second slide they do the application of the models uh, and discussing the events on the second slide for both unemployment and inflation. Either one is fine. Um, I just want to let you know sort of what the options are um, and make sure that you don't miss anything depending on how you choose to sort of structure your work. So whatever feels most comfortable for you. Or if you want to have it split out into four slides, um, that's also another option. We're not really going to ding you for, for length. We're going over the length. This is these, you know, one to two slides length. It's really more, more like two. One slide is probably would be too busy. Um, but those are just guidelines for you. So you sort of have an idea of what the expectations are. Yeah, so Ellen says she's seen a lot of people use four slides and that it makes it easier. So 
Um, it's been a while since I taught this course, so I can't recall specifically what I've most commonly seen, but um, you know, whatever, really whatever makes it easiest for you to hit each of these critical elements and fulfill the expectations for each one and show your instructor that you understand um, each of these, each of these uh, data sets that you're presenting and what they mean in terms of the events that went on in that time period. Those are the, really the main, the main goals that we want for you in these slides. And if it's easier to break everything up and look at it a little more narrowly um, to make sure you don't miss anything, that's fantastic. Exactly, Michelle. So Michelle asks, points points will not be removed if you have extra slides. Um, that's fine. This is again the, the the slide numbers up here are just a, a a guideline. So you know that we're not expecting as a bare minimum like five slides to cover this. Well, a lot of students can do. It. I, I should switch it. It shouldn't say one. I should switch it to two because <laughs> um, it is a lot to cover in one slide. Um, but if you need a few more then so be it. Yeah, so the data that's going into it, really, like I mentioned with the GDP, your FRED is probably the best source for this data. I mean, you can get, especially unemployment, you know, you can get that stuff from other sources like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but FRED centralizes all, all that data and creates graphs for you. You just have to adjust it for your time period. So really, you're just kind of grabbing this graph that you create in Fred and, and sharing it um, in your on your slides. So it doesn't necessarily have to take up a lot of room. Um, you're just you know showing this line graph. So hopefully it's not too busy. All right, and I see that someone has asked about the ADAS model. So you'll see in the bullet point it was uh, Melissa that it does mention that that's for the final draft. So the ADAS model is one of those models that we haven't developed yet. So we've looked at the GDP formula already. Um, we're already learning about unemployment and inflation um, this week, but we haven't quite got to the ADAS model, which is the demand supply model, aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Um, so it's kind of similar to what we did in micro with the supply and demand model, but this is obviously at the macro level. Um, we're going to be covering that, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, next week. Might be week four that we cover that. So um, once you get to the final, you will have this under your belt, and you'll be really familiar with it, and you'll be able to apply it. So this is one of those times where you might want to come back and maybe fill out this section a little bit more and make sure you meet those final draft expectations that, again, are, those expectations are a little bit higher than the expectations for the milestone. All right. And again, speaker notes. <laughs> so even if you, um, like Ellen mentioned, you know, you might want to spread this out over four slides. Even if you're spreading it out over four slides, do make sure that you've got speaker notes on each of those slides. Even if two slides go with one critical element that you're graded on, you still do want to explain. Because again, if you were presenting the slide to a group, you would say something about it. So what you would say about it should be on each slide that has content. And it sounds like a, I, I'm, I'm really interested by the comment about um, micro. And if anybody would indulge me in helping improve the resources for micro, I would love it if you would email me. I'm going to type my email real quick. <laughs> um, because this is the kind of feedback that, I mean, for me, is just invaluable. Um, because we want students to feel that both courses are supportive. Um, and since micro comes first, um, we definitely don't want to leave those students hanging. So if you have some specific examples, I would really appreciate it if you emailed me with that. Uh, with that feedback about how micro you felt that there was less support or less uh, resources available to you than this course. That would be great. Thank you guys so much <laughs> if you would do that. All right, so moving on to the last critical element. So unemployment and inflation had two critical elements. GDP had two critical elements. So we've got one more to round it out, and this one is on interest rates. So you're going to analyze the interest rate fluctuations throughout this time period and their effect on other aspects of the economy. So again, this is the data collection portion of your project. You're going to get that 10-year graph up. So annual 
interest rates for each 10 years. You're going to share it right here. Again, you can get this data from Fred. That's probably the easiest place to get it. There's a couple different interest rates you can share. Most students share the federal funds rate. That's the most, that's the kind of base point rate um, that the Federal Reserve sets. And then from there, the rates um, get higher <laughs> and can, can vary a little bit. So usually we recommend that students use the federal funds rate, but these other rates are applicable as well if you want to share those. Oh no, the link did work. I lost you guys. Um, the links did work for me. So these are links to each of them, um, to the data sets for each of them. Again, you would have to adjust it for your time period. But the three-month treasury rate, so that's the, um, the interest rate paid on, um, on US bonds that have a three-month maturity, and then the bank prime loan rate. Um, the bank prime loan rate is you know, the kind of the base rate for um, banks that we would use as, as regular people. <laughs> so th those are really the, the fundamental ones that we recommend that you use, again, with the federal funds rate being the real basic starting point one that, that is the highest recommended for, for your purposes. Um, and then once you've got your data, you've, you share, ideally you share your graph, just like you did with the other ones. Um, again, I think a graph is much better than a table listing out the numbers because you really get a sense of the trend. Um, you're going to discuss a few things. How would these fluctuations affect or be affected by inflation? How would investments in foreign trade increase or decrease? And how would GDP of the American economy be affected? So that might seem like a lot, <laughs> um, but we do have a link here. Um, that to a video from our MyLab course that discusses each of these things. So these relationships are, are spelled out for you in our textbook and in this video it walks you through them. So you're just going to apply it to the actual movements that you see in inflate, uh, I'm sorry, in the interest rate in your period. So if interest rate was increasing, what does that mean about GDP? If interest rate was decreasing, what does that mean about GDP? So we just want to make sure that you are putting it in terms of what actually happened to interest rates within your time period. But the relationships, that, that relationship between interest rate and GDP is, is already spelled out for you. You just have to look at, okay, which direction were interest rates going during my time period? And then describe the relationship from there. All right. Yeah, the, the tables are fine. Um, one thing that I think is nice about the graphs, and you can always you can make your, you can get a table, and then you can make your own graph. I I think that that's a good exercise, especially um, if y'all are business students. Making graphs is something that a lot of times we have to do at work when we put together presentations like this. Um, and the reason I think that graphs are so nice is because it helps you visualize what's going on um, as well. But again, it's not, it's not necessary. What's necessary is that you present the data. So that's, that's really the, the hard line there is that you get us, you get your instructor the annual data for 10 years, for your 10-year time period. All right, um, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any questions. It looks like Andrew had some questions. How do I get the links to work from the PowerPoint? <coughs> um, so we mentioned earlier, if when you get this PowerPoint presentation, um, you won't be able to do it here. But again, you can, you can download this from your course. Um, to get the links to work, you need it in presentation mode. So uh, once you open up the file, you can um, click View Slideshow. Um, or presentation view, you, you know, either there's a couple different ways to get there. Uh, but if you go through view slideshow and you just turn the pages, all these links will be activated as you click on them. Okay, uh, one last slide, and that is for your reference pages. So just like Eco201, and just like I believe all of the courses in, um, in the business, in the business core, um, we all use APA style. So there is no APA style for PowerPoint presentation. So when you're doing a paper like the eco, like you did in 201, um, there's a lot of rules in terms of you know the running head and the abstract. PowerPoint doesn't have the same rules for APA. 
So when we say APA style, we're referring to your in-text citations, which are required. So when you put up a graph from Fred, I mean, I 100% I support students just making their graph in Fred and copy pasting it and putting it into their, into their presentation here. That is totally approved. You still need to cite it. I mean, all the data you're going to collect, you had to have gotten from somewhere. So all the data you share should have an in-text citation. And then, of course, um, you're going to have a reference to match up with all of your in-text citations. Um, and all of those are going to be in APA style. So Purdue OWL is one place where students are directed for APA um, rules. Um, the, our library has lots of resources for citation management. Um, for APA specifically, and then a lot of students rely on some of those websites that will do the, um, the citation for you, like Cite This For Me, um, that's, that's one I hear students use a lot. So all that stuff is fine. Just As long as you can get your references and all your in-text citations in APA style, you're, you're good to go. Um, Eric, I'm not sure, no, they, they don't need to be in Times New and 12 point, because to be honest, I don't think that the, 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 um, the PowerPoint template is set up with that font or that, that type size, so you want it to look like the rest of your paper. So um, whatever the, t the font is that's set up is the font that you're going to follow through. So PowerPoints, people use different fonts. I mean, don't, don't do something crazy and... Don't make your instructor mad and use Comic Sans or anything like that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think the default for PowerPoint might be Calibri. So, you know, you're not going to change your reference page to Times New Roman. The Times New Roman is more for um, the Word document, the papers. Um, whereas you, you have a little bit more leeway here in uh, PowerPoint. Wait, not wingdings. <laughs> no, please do not present in wingdings. <laughs> I don't know, but Comic Sans might be worse than Wingdings. <laughs> um, so Sean says, I don't see the links in my PowerPoint. Um, so I haven't checked the courses this term to make sure that the, the files are all accurate, but um, I haven't heard from any of the instructors that the, the PowerPoint share doesn't have the links, but um, if I will definitely double check. We've got a lot of instructors on the line and they can check their courses and make sure that all the links are working. If the links are not working, we will absolutely get that fixed and um, re-upload these, uh, these guides for you and make sure that you guys have the ones with, with the appropriate links. Okay, Mike, Mike seems to maybe have the answer to Sean's question, that maybe there are mistakenly two links, two, two files provided. Sorry about that. We'll definitely take a look at the, um, the file organization and clean it up. Oh, great. Thank you, Kiara, for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, I really can't. I know we're past time. Um, we are finished, but um, so if, if you have stuff to get done, I totally understand. Um, but yeah, the, Fred has a lot of how-to videos that they've created themselves. Um, for student use and for instructor use. So uh, if you get to Fred and you don't, you just don't feel comfortable, or if you want to know like how to jazz things up, <laughs> um, go check out some of their some of their tutorials. They they walk you through either through a video or through like a step by step like PDF showing you what to click on, on how to do lots of cool stuff with with their data sets. So uh, I would highly recommend checking out um, the educational materials they've got. Michelle, I'm so glad to hear that. That's, that's the whole purpose of these webinars, is to kind of put everybody's mind at ease and um, settle any lingering questions you have, even after reading through some of the, the materials shared in the course. So, um, And again, I really can't stress enough that while we want you to put your best effort forward in this milestone. Um, it is a milestone. It is sort of, in a sense, a rough draft. I mean, it, it is graded, and it's a decent chunk of your grade, but 
the expectations are just a, a touch lower than they will be on the final project. And you're going to have, a, this is your opportunity to get some great feedback from your instructor and use that to um, make improvements and prepare yourself for when you've got more knowledge of macroeconomics to enhance each of these sections. So um, don't let yourself get too overwhelmed. And like they say, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, if you don't feel that this is perfect, that's OK, because it's just a milestone. And um, you're going to have the chance to revise. All right. Well, it doesn't look like there are any other unanswered questions. If we missed a question, please repeat it before, um, before we close out the session. Um, I don't want anyone to, to have been missed. You're welcome, Jennifer. <laughs> Oh, good, Eric. I'm glad to hear that you guys like connect better. Um, I think wh while sometimes I know students like to, to talk, I think it makes it so much easier to have the mics off and just use the chat. Um, and yeah, logging on, I think, has been and super easy. And we haven't had any glitches. So I'm, I'm very happy with the platform. I'm glad to hear from your end as a participant, it's, it's all so good. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Jerry, you mean the webinars in general? We should have for other classes? Um, yeah, so I know the inspiration for this is actually from our wonderful um, faculty lead for OL125. So I'm sure a lot of you have taken that course earlier in your time here at SNU. Um, so she started with uh, more of a Q&A type session than a going through the project like we do here. Um, and opened it, there's, they have a lot more students. So they had it open for two hours and students would just kind of pop in and ask their questions. But um, she said it worked really well and it made students feel a lot more comfortable. And so we figured we'd try it in ECO and it's, and it's been really great. Um, just like you all are saying. And now they do it, and they do it in marketing as well, marketing 113, and they do it for INT 113. And they do it for the two accounting courses, ACC 201 and 202. So, um, and maybe even for business 206. So yeah, a lot of our um, business core courses have something like this. Um, but yeah, we'll have to give the nudge to some of the other departments outside of business. Oh, good to hear it, Roberta. Not good to hear that you were in panic mode, but good to hear that this helps. <laughs> and Sean found the template. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that the links in this, I mean, obviously to Fred are really helpful, but even just the links to sort of remind you of, um, of, of the concepts, you know, okay, well, what, how do we define inflation again? And how do we define unemployment? And, um, you know, you read through the textbook, but it's always nice to have a quick and easy way to, to remind yourself and refresh your memory from your reading. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'm sorry that we went a little bit over time. So thanks for sticking around these extra eight minutes. And um, if you have any questions after tonight's meeting, um, Right away, I would just shoot your instructor an email um, before too long. It's only Wednesday, so we still have quite a, quite a few days before your milestones do. So the sooner you get your questions um, to your instructor about your work, the sooner you'll get your answer and you'll be able to move on. Um, and I have my email here, so if anybody has any general suggestions, uh, like especially about the micro versus macro thing in terms of the resources that were available, don't forget to email me. Last question. Shoot, Jerry. Go for it. Eric, that's a really great idea. I can see, I think Adobe Connect, I think this platform does polls. So I could do a poll um, before you guys go 
And it would be anonymous. But the, yeah, that could be cool. I'll, I'll, I'll look into that totally. Yeah, great suggestion. Thank you. So the models, um, Jerry asks if the models are offered in the textbook. Yes. So the GDP formula, which is the first one we talked about, um, is absolutely in your textbook in the, the chapter on GDP. So the consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. And they go through all that. Um, the fr FRED actually has a really neat feature where you can break down consumption, government spending, all those things, and you can see them stacked up. So that's that's pretty cool uh, thing that they do that you can get some advice if you want to put that in your paper. And that'll really show off to your instructor. Um, so that's in there. And then the ADA, uh, the ADAS model um, is coming up. I forget the exact chapter number. Forgive me. It's, it's been a while since I actually taught this course. Um, so I haven't been in the textbook. Um, maybe Ellen or Kiara know offhand when that, um, the, the chapter number that it's introduced. But yeah, those are definitely um, in there. And we've got links to them um, in our templates that will bring you right to like the video that's associated with that part of the chapter. So the nice thing about our textbook is that the key concepts all have a video that go with them that the, um, the textbook writer has created. So that's what we link to here. Yeah, Michelle, get them. <laughs> Thank you. Chapters 10 and 3, uh, 10 and 13, that, that, that sounds right. Mm. Yeah. So, um, but again, no instructor is going to expect you to do that. And, and I, I really wouldn't recommend trying to wrap your head around the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model for this milestone. You, there's a plenty of work to do here without doing that. And you really want the support of everything that's in the module to fully understand that concept um, without trying to figure it out on your own. That, that's my advice. Um, but, you know, you are in charge of your project, so. <laughs> but it, it, certainly there's no instructor who's expecting anybody to bust out the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model for a milestone one. Okay. Yeah, no, me neither. <laughs> if I haven't covered it in class, I would never expect you guys to have mastered it enough to put in a project. So, all right. Well, thank you all so much. Um, have a great night and good luck on getting your first milestone done. <laughs>